Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. I just heard that you are facing your finals shortly. And uh, even though you must be very busy, you chose to come here. And of course, uh, some of you will be traveling to Japan. So I thought that I might give you uh, some ideas of uh, where you're going. Um, as uh, Professor Pike just said, uh, your president, our prime minister, met in Florida. And they talked about trade, they talked about uh, security, so this is enough of a topic to cover. But that, you can do that by reading newspapers or uh, pick up some news on the internet. So I decided to rather give you a perspective of where Japan came from, because that perspective will tell you well where Japan is headed to. Now, this is a very good year to do that because it's the 150th anniversary of the Meiji Restoration, 1868. Now, what is 1868? The United States was recovering from its, the wounds of the Civil War around that time. Uh, California was connected to the East Coast by railway uh, approximately that time. So this is the, the time frame that we are talking about. Since then, 150 years, and I will cover 150 years in like 45 minutes. I've, maybe I've spent already a decade. So let me go on and uh, show you uh, what East Asia looked like at that time. So the Meiji Restoration was uh, something that took place in 1868. But I have to give you a background of uh, the uh, global situation then. This is a painting from uh, depicting a war in 1840. This is the Opium War. In 1840, the British attacked Qing, the Qing Dynasty, Qing China, and uh, defeated the Qing, and that led to uh, opening up ports and whatnot, extra tradition, excuse me. And uh, the Chinese call it the, the start of the century of humiliation, all the way until the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Um, it's a long time that uh, China was under semi-colonialism. But why did the British attack uh, the Chinese? Because the Chinese uh, were very upset about uh, the British selling opium to them, so they confiscated British opium and destroyed it. So why did the Chinese destroy opium? Because it was poisoning the people. It was poisoning the Chinese people. They became addicted, and uh, this was a very severe problem in China. But why did the British sell opium to the Chinese? It's because they wanted to buy tea from China. In exchange, they wanted to sell something. Ch but the Chinese monopolized tea. There were only 13 companies who were authorized to deal in tea business, and they, these companies were concentrated in the southernmost port of Guangdong. Um, today it's called Guangzhou. So uh, all these companies were dealing with tea, only 13 in Guangdong, but the tea that the British preferred came from Anhui, that is uh, near Shanghai, way up north. Uh, so this is a very typical uh, case of monopolizing uh, resources to, uh, uh, and of course the prices shot up. And uh, the British, uh, with the lack of any good, better idea, decided that they're going to sell opium because that's, that sells at a very high price. So it can be said that uh, uh, the monopoly of tea led to the century of humiliation. You can say that it is uh, self-inflicted, but anyhow, that invited colonialism into China. So Jap Japan, Looking at this, did it wake up? Japan did not wake up until the black ships came in the 1850s. Um, the black ships, four of them, were led by this gentleman. He, uh, this is Commodore Perry, as seen from the Japanese eyes. He was out there whaling, commercial whaling, and uh, when they want to whale, they want to catch. They, they were catching whale, getting the uh, oil out of it, and throwing the rest of it back into the ocean. But uh, they needed a lot of timber, they needed a lot of water uh, to do whaling, so they came to Japan and demanded Japan to open up the ports. They had gunboats, huge ones. And uh, the Japanese were scared. 
Until then, the Japanese were enjoying 300 years of peace, no civil war. Uh, the samurai clan, uh, samurai class, uh, approximately 10% of the population, they were wearing weapons on their waists and they were wearing ponytails, uh, backwards, sort of. And uh, it was a very, very feudal country. Um, by the way, this is how uh, Commodore Perry really looks like. So uh, he, the Japanese saw him like a kabuki actor or something. But uh, after this, the Japanese woke up and uh, after a very bitter civil war, Japan uh, changed itself. This is called the Meiji Restoration. The country of Japan was uh, uh, governed by a milita uh, military regime in Yedo, now it is Tokyo. It's called the Yedo uh, Shogunate. The Tokugawa family was running the, the uh, Yedo Shogunate, and uh, Western warlords uh, fought against the Shogunate and toppled that government. And because it was 300 years under the samurai rule and the people's mindset was uh, heavily relying on the samurai kind of mindset. So in order to change that and in order to mobilize all the people, like 80% uh, were farmers, uh, the Meiji government came up with a different idea. They uh, brought the emperor from Kyoto to Tokyo. And because the emperor was believed to be the, the, a descendant of the sun goddess. So Shintoism, which was a very... Uh, kind of uh, uh, loose religion. May, uh, may, it's not maybe even a religion, it's just a uh, conglomerate of customs. Uh, they, Shintoism doesn't have any Bible or anything. Uh, but uh, they made Shintoism into state religion, and since em the emperor was believed to be a descendant of the deities, uh, he gained for, uh, new authority as compared to the, the samurai class. Now, with the new government, Japan uh, went on reforming itself in the political arena. Japan went parliamentarian, so Japan opened its diet in the 1890s. And uh, this is the gentleman, um, Ozaki, uh, Yukio Ozaki, who is called, referred to as the father of Japanese parliamentarianism. Um, he was a Diet member for a very long time, and uh, he formed the basis of Japanese parliamentarianism. But uh, when he was mayor of Tokyo, when he was young, he donated uh, cherry blossom, cherry trees, to Washington, D.C. And I think uh, you, many of you know that uh, cherry blossom is now the symbol of Washington, D.C. They were donated by uh, the mayor of Tokyo more than one, 100 years ago. Now, uh, in the economic sphere, we went capitalist. Okay. Um, this is the father of Japanese capitalism, Shibusawa, Eiichi Shibusawa. So he did everything. He taught the Japanese how to invest. He taught the Japanese how to do banking. And uh, he also taught the Japanese to engage in, in philanthropy. So he set up a lot of uh, philanthropic bodies, such as this uh, newspaper article showing that he gathered some money to help the Armenians, Armenian refugees, uh, at, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century. Now. Cultural, Japan went modern, but we kept the tradition at the same time. It's a modernity and tradition that uh, outlines the uh, characteristic of Japanese culture even today. And this gentleman is the father of Japanese culture, Tenshin Okakura. Tenshin Okakura, uh, he's wearing kimono. And uh, I, I wear kimono sometimes myself, and it's not very strange for someone in Japan to wear traditional costumes. We do that in festivities and all that. Um, but he introduced Japanese culture to the world. This is one of his uh, major works, The Book of Tea. And through this book, he told the world what Japan is all about. So these are the uh, three aspects of a nation state, politics, economics, and culture. And Japan started transforming itself. But the International environment surrounding Japan was not very favorable at that time. The Qing, although it was defeated by the British, it was still a very powerful existence. And as you can see, uh, the Korean Peninsula sticks right out from the Qing Dynasty towards Japan. And the Qing had military presence there. It had tremendous influence over Korea. Now, I'm going to skip the details, but Japan went to war with China over uh, Korea. Um, of course, Qing, the Qing ha at that time had the biggest 
Blue Sea Navy in Asia. Um, it had two battleships, the largest battleships in the world at that time. Um, so China did have a Blue Sea, Blue Water Navy uh, even back then. And the, the flagship was Dingyuan and Zhenyuan, the two huge gunboats. The Japanese Navy went to, on an inspection tour to China, saw these gunboats, and saw laundry hanging from the cannons. And uh, because the Japanese were ex samurais uh, weapons for them were very holy. And, uh, holy. Uh, uh, the swords were cherished as uh, uh, almost as uh, divine objects. So if you look at a navy that hangs laundry onto cannons, the Japanese thought, maybe, maybe we have a chance. So they went to war, the, the Battle of the Yellow Sea, and it was a very fierce battle, but the Japanese Navy uh, prevailed. The mighty Ding Yuan was half destroyed, and uh, it eventually sank, and the Chen Yuan was captured, and it was th uh, used, reused in the Russo-Japanese War, which means Japan went to war with Russia. Why did Japan go to war with Russia? It's because after the fall of the Qing, the Russian Empire became very influential. It was exerting uh, uh, influence over Korea. So the Korean Peninsula is still st sticking out towards Japan. And Japan uh, was very, very wary of uh, the Russian Empire. So uh, Japan went to war. Again, it's uh, about influence over Korea. Korea was an independent country then. But after the war, Japan started uh, depriving Korea of its uh, sovereignty. Uh, step by step, but that didn't end because uh, Russia, the Russian Empire changed into the Soviet Union and uh, of course by that time Japan had annexed Korea, still Russia was building railroads in Manchuria, so what Japan did was to uh, set up a kind of a coup and um, set up a, a puppet government in Manchuria. Unfortunately, the Japanese expansion did not stop here. The Japanese were still wary of the Soviet Union, so it started occupying other parts of China. And because uh, that antagonized the Western world and uh, sanctions were applied to Japan, Japan, instead of succumbing to sanctions, attacked Pearl Harbor. So this is uh, when the Japanese empire had its biggest sphere. If you look at the land mass alone, that's the land mass is twice the size of India. So you can see how huge Japan became. But, this, but with its limited resources, including limited population, this is, this is grossly unsustainable. So although Japan occupied all these former colonies uh, around Southeast Asia, Japan was eventually defeated and uh, signed the uh, instrument of surrender on USS Missouri, September. 1945. And from this time, 1945, until Japan signed another treaty, San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1951, Japan was not independent. Japan was under the uh, guidance of General Headquarters, GHQ, and GHQ was uh, uh, guided by General MacArthur. So General MacArthur was basically running Japan, and the Japanese were uh, carefully listening to what he told Japan to do. And during these uh, six, seven years of uh, non-independence, Japan went through the war tribunals. And uh, here's a comparison between uh, Germany and Japan. Germany had its Nuremberg trial. Japan had uh, Tokyo primarily, but in other areas of Asia. So at the Nuremberg trial, the Nazis were tried and uh, it was decided they committed crime against humanity. And according to the statute of the court, this is called Class C, war crimes. Uh, other war machines of, the, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany, uh, they committed crime against peace, that's Class A, or conventional war crimes, that's Class B. Now, Japan, with its Imperial Army and Imperial Navy, was, were, was decided that it committed a crime against peace, that's the crime of waging war, and conventional war crimes. So there's a difference between Japan and the, uh, Germany, well, I should say Tokyo and Nuremberg, that uh, there, are no, there are no specific uh, uh, judgment concerning crime against humanity. And uh, this being a heavily Anglo-Saxon 
uh, Anglo-American court, double jeopardy applies, which means uh, one strike, you're out. Okay, you can't appeal, but you can't appeal. But at the same time, if you are not tried for crimes in this court, you will be never, you will never be tried again. That's double jeopardy. Now, um, as a result of these trials, and uh, as I said, it's not only Tokyo. Uh, there were other courts uh, under USA, United Kingdom, Australia, all over Asia, and 1,000, close to 1,000 officers and soldiers. Uh, were executed. The Japanese paid with their lives. Um, one concrete example is the Sumarang Station case, which was uh, judged at the Netherlands Temporary Court Martial at Batavia, that's uh, present-day Indonesia. What happened there is that four brothels were set up in occupied Dutch East Indies. And uh, at that time, the military had an order, if you want to set up brothels, the, the ladies who will serve there need to be volunteers, they need to volunteer to do that job. But somehow, the military on the ground did not listen to that and recruited uh, some Dutch ladies forcefully. The Japanese military learned about this misconduct and uh, closed down the brothels, but uh, the Japanese military fell short. It did not punish those who were responsible for, these, for this forced prostitution. So what happened is after the war, uh, 11 were found guilty of conventional war crimes, and the, uh, the ma army major who was in charge of all this was sentenced to death, which means that the Japanese military was aware of the illegality of what was going on, but they did not punish. Punishment came. So those who uh, were responsible for what we, know, uh, what we know of as the comfort women were found guilty and punished. Now, comfort women is something uh, some of you might not have heard of. These are uh, ladies serving in the sex industry near close to the front line. And uh, it was widely known in Japan that uh, these ladies existed. And even after the war, there were movies that featured these ladies. Um, this is a movie called Shumpuden, first made in 1950, a remake, 1965. This features... Uh, a comfort woman who uh, falls in love with a soldier. An interesting uh, aspect is that it, this is based on a novel. The novel had a Korean comfort woman as a heroine. But uh, when they first made the movie in 1950, GHQ ordered that it should not be a Korean. So the ethnicity was changed to Japanese. And now in the remake, I saw the remake in, uh, came out in 1965, the nationality remained Japanese, although there were Korean comfort women also featured in the movie. Um, this Sparado Outpost, 1959, this shows a Chinese comfort woman, and uh, she was uh, brutally murdered. And uh, well, what happened is that a soldier uh, discovered that his uh, officer was corrupt, he was uh, uh, accepting bribes, and he wanted to expose it. And the officer murdered that soldier, and together with that, he murdered the comfort woman, and disguised as though they were they fell in love with each other and uh, killed each other. Uh, so uh, here, a Chinese lady was featured. Blood and Sand, 1965. Uh, this is an, again a Korean lady, uh, but this is not about. Uh, this is a very unusual war movie. The the uh, commando is uh, base is basically Boy Scouts, 15 year old. And they were not even soldiers, they were brass band troops. But because the war was coming to an end, uh, they had to engage in warfare too. And the, the lady worked as a kind of a mother-like, sister-like figure in this movie. Uh, and uh, that man who is es escorting the comfort woman on horseback is Toshiro Mifune. I think you know Toshiro Mifune, he's uh, very famous for appearing in The Seven Samurais. <laughs> And uh, finally, Hoodlum Soldier, uh, that's Shin Katsu Shintaro, uh, maybe you know Zatoichi, the uh, uh, what, uh, visually challenged uh, monk who can cut people into pieces. And uh, he's discussing an evacuation plan with Japanese and Korean uh, comfort women, 1965. So you can see that 1965 was an year where these movies were all made. Um, I'd like to turn to the economic aspect of what Japan did after the war. Japan paid reparations to the Philippines, Vietnam, Burma, 
uh, today Myanmar and Indonesia. And as you notice, none of these countries were independent at the end of the war. Japan paid these countries after they gained independence. And on top of this, Japan gave up its overseas assets that was estimated to amount to about 20 billion US dollars. So Japan renounced, renounced rights to any of the assets it's left uh, during its aggression into Asia in those years. As far as Korea is concerned, because Japan was not at war with Korea, uh, if you remember, Japan annexed Korea. So there is no way to have a peace treaty. So instead, uh, Japan and Korea uh, signed a basic relations treaty. And in this, Japan paid uh, 1.6 years worth of uh, national, the national budget of the Republic of Korea. And in this uh, treaty, it is written that problems in regard to property and claims between Japan and Korea has been settled completely and finally. And this is 1965. You remember the year what happened in Japan in 1965. Um, the moral aspect. Uh, the Japanese leadership was kind of ambiguous about the moral um, responsibility of Japan of our deeds during the war. But on the 50th anniversary, uh, Prime Minister Murayama came out with a statement acknowledging um, colonial rule and aggression that Japan inflicted upon its neighbors and expressed deep remorse and heartfelt apology. Now this came out in 1995, the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, and this was decided by the cabinet. It's not a private statement, it's a cabinet decision. And as far as the uh, comfort moment issue is concerned, uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono came, out, came up with this statement of acknowledging the wrong deeds of the Japanese military concerning Korean women and extended sincere apologies and remorse. And this was uh, 1993. But this issue is a very contentious one, so it did not end here. Uh, 1996. Uh, atonement was paid from the Japanese people and uh, together with a letter from the Prime Minister expressing uh, sincere apologies and remorse. Uh, 1998, when then President of Korea Kim Dae-jung visited Japan, Prime Minister Obuchi expressed his deep remorse and heartfelt apology. And in April 2015, when Prime Minister Abe visited the United States, uh, he attended a press conference together with President Obama, and there he said this issue of comfort women is a result of victimizing, victimization due to human trafficking. So he acknowledged the human rights aspect of this issue. And all this accumulated into the agreement between Japan and Korea in December 2015, uh, in which it was announced that Prime Minister Abe expresses his, anew his most sincere apologies and remorse. And Japan paid one billion yen to a fund that would take care of uh, uh, these ladies. And the issue is resolved finally and irreversibly with this announcement. So this is how Japan faced this issue. And, uh, but the most important thing is uh, Japan's commitment to peace. Now, Japan started its first military aggression outside its borders in 1874. May 22, 1874, Japan invaded Taiwan because there were Okinawan fishermen who were marooned to Taiwan and they were brutally massacred. And the Japanese government filed a complaint to the Qing, the Chinese government. The Chinese response was, oh, Taiwan is so far away, it is not under our influence, therefore we will take no responsibility. And having studied international law, Japan decided to retaliate because retaliation was legal. It's not legal now, but then retaliation was legal, so Japan retaliated, occupied parts of Taiwan, and that's the first shot abroad. And uh, ever since, Japan was uh, engaged, engaged itself in its uh, act of aggression against its neighbors for 71 years, 71 years and 12 weeks, that's a very long time. But this all ended August 15th when ceasefire was declared. And, I, and we, when we count 71 years and 12 weeks from that time, it's already passed. The Japanese history of peace is now longer than its history of aggression. And it is 
getting longer and longer day by day. And this is the commitment that Japan is showing. This is the remorse. It's, it is about words, it is about money, but it is about what Japan is actually doing. Not firing a single shot abroad for 72 years now. Based on the remorse of uh, what Japan did during the war, Japan rebuilt itself. Politically, uh, once again, it's a parliamentarian democracy. Economically, it's capitalism and cultural modernity and tradition. So the basic structure of the Meiji state has not changed. Of course, we are more democratic than what it used to be because we changed the constitution. Economy, um, we're still capitalist, but uh, we got rid of all the, uh, the uh, big companies that were ruling Japan. So it's uh, basically quite a democratic uh, economic system. By the way, uh, probably some of you think that China has become a capitalism. That's kind of a truism. You look at high rises in Beijing and Shanghai and the business transaction that's taking place. China looks like a capitalism, but it is not capitalism. Why? Because capitalism is based on free flow of capital. That's what capitalism is about. There is no free flow of capital in China. It is controlled and uh, the Shanghai Stock Exchange is it's closed circuit. It's not an open circuit. And many of the company leaders are at the same time party officials and military officers. So this is not capitalism. It's better understood by calling it mercantilism. Um, and culturally, Japan is still pursuing uh, tradition, although it's very, very modern. Um, this is to show you uh, some aspects of the economic... I want to highlight the, highlight the economic aspect of uh, U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship. Um, this shows uh, foreign direct investment uh, from Japan to the United States as compared to other entities. Uh, U.K. is the biggest. Japan is number two and uh, Netherlands, Canada follow uh, the amount of uh, direct investment to the United States. And direct investment, of course, it means creating jobs. Now, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, also working at the foreign ministry, always says that uh, it took, you know, in 1812, the British burned down the White House. So it took them 200 years to come to number one. See, it took Japan 70 years to come to number two, so, and uh, we don't even speak the language, so... Uh, see, this is, a, this is a remarkable achievement. Um, what the president said today, huge deficit, uh, that's, that was true in the 1990s. Japan was number one, um, what, uh, exporting country to the United States, but now it has diminished. Now China is number one, and Japan lags even behind EU. Although, yes, of course, Japan has a lot of uh, trade surplus, against the United States, but it's not number one anymore. Uh, when you look at Japanese cars running around, and especially in California, you see a lot of Japanese cars running around, but these are not built in Japan. 70% of Japanese cars running around in the US are built in the United States by American workers using American parts. These are American cars, Japanese brand. But the, since the demand is so big, Japan also uh, keeps on exporting cars that are built in Japan, so there is still a deficit there. Um, by the way, Japan is also buying American cars, a lot of them actually. Uh, the only thing is that it's not American brand, it's German brand. But German cars that Japan imports, most of them are built here in the United States, Mercedes, Audi. These are American cars, American workers, American parts, but German brands, and we buy a lot of that. So if you just look at the figures, Japan is importing a lot, a lot of cars from the United States, but it's not Ford. You can't, um, I'm not sure if I can drive a Ford in Tokyo streets, uh, you can see for yourselves, but uh, uh, Mercedes is smaller. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, my favorite topic here, films with vision, films that were made some time ago, but uh, correctly depict what Japan is. Um, this is a movie called Battleship. Um, this, uh, it, it's about uh, an alien attack on Earth. And this uh, poster shows a Japanese self-defense force officer protecting an American naval officer. 
And what is so visionary about this? In 2012, this was illegal. It was unlawful for a Japanese military personnel to protect its ally, his ally, because we did not have no provision in the law to do that. Um, Ghost in the Shell, the film is 2017, but the, cart the manga came out in 1989, and this is a geisha girl robot serving dinner uh, at a banquet. And then she goes on a uh, killing spree, but uh, that, that's another story. Um, another, my favorite, uh, Akira. Akira came out as a cartoon manga in 1982, and uh, this is th this, these are clips from the animation. But in 1982, Akira predicted that Tokyo will be hosting Olympic Games in 2020. See? S says so. Now, what's upcoming is that uh, now Japan has a legislation for peace and security. So now it is legal, it is lawful for Japanese military personnel to protect allies. Now, robots. Asimo is serving dinner. It's happening. And of course, the Tokyo Olympics are happening too. So uh, this is what is upcoming. And uh, Japan will go on trying to promote its positive image in the world as, as much as possible in institutions like the Japan House. Japan House uh, is, uh, in the US, it's open on Hollywood Highland. And uh, elsewhere, it's in Sao Paulo, and it will come up in London quite shortly. So there are only three Japan houses along, around the world, and one of them is in Los Angeles. Now this uh, logo, this is the logo of Japan House. It's uh, the same logo for all three Japan houses around the world. It's very simple, looks very noble, uh, it looks very Japanese, and I'm going to show you how Japanese it is. Uh, this is, uh, what do you call that, uh, helmet guard that my ancestors left me when he wore a helmet to go to battle, he had to protect his forehead. It hurts to wear a helmet. And uh, that, uh, these circles are my family crest. But you see the shape. The shape is exactly like the logo of Japan House. This shows how Japanese that uh, shape is. Again, it's uh, modernity in tradition or tradition in modernity whatever. And here is Japan House. We are going to have a Hollywood style opening, which means we opened the shop already last year, December, shortly before Christmas. That promised us a lot of uh, pre-holiday shopping. We opened the gallery uh, earlier this year in January with a fashion exhibition, but it's not just fashion. Um, so if it's in normal light, just, it's just white clothing, but when you uh, put, out, put off the lights and uh, take a photo with a flashlight, then you see the patterns, they suddenly appear. It, this is very high-tech fashion. So this is kind of a feeling that we wanted to uh, communicate through Japan House. So high-tech, so high-end, but very traditional at the same time. Now, we are still building on a separate uh, place, we are building a restaurant that's also a part of Japan House. This will open sometime in 2018. We plan to make it a very high-end kind of restaurant. It commands a perfect view over Hollywood. Now, I, I believe you have, although you are very good studious students, you have been to Hollywood maybe once a year. Uh, this is where Japan House is located. Um, so Hollywood Boulevard, Highland from uh, north to south. And uh, there's the uh, uh, Dolby Theater, Dolby Theater, where the Academy Award is uh, given out. And before entering the Dolby Theater, on the second floor, right-hand side, you see Japan House. But uh, this is not a very good photograph, so uh, i put up a map like this. Um, it's in between the Chinese Theater and the, uh, the plaza, which has uh, elephant figures, a Byzantine theme. And in between, there's the uh, uh, Dolby Theater and the stairway and the red carpet. And right there is Japan House. So uh, I hope you can come and visit Japan House sometime. Um, now they have a second exhibition. It's uh, called Takeo Paper. Uh, it's basically paper, but not origami. 
Um, and I, I just can't explain how it, you have to see for yourselves. It's, uh, it doesn't look like paper, but uh, please look forward to visiting it. And with that, uh, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much for listening. Double jeopardy is a, uh, uh, a rule in courts that uh, you judge someone and come out with a verdict. And if you and usually you get to appeal like twice, right? You go to uh, all the way to Supreme Court. But then um, after the judgment is done and the judgment is decided, you will not be judged for the same crime again, right? That's double jeopardy. You will not be jeopardized twice for the same thing you, you committed. There was, a, of course, a mixed feeling where we were taught at schools that Americans and the British are devils. So the devils come. So we see them, and uh, we realize they're not devils. See? And uh, the American troops there even try to help us out of the misery of uh, being defeated in a war. So uh, there was a mixed feeling, but all in all, uh, there was no attack against USGIs during occupation. Um, there, I can give you many reasons for that, but uh, what happened is that the Japanese accepted uh, the occupying forces. Uh, uh, there's a famous book called Embracing Defeat, written by Professor Dower, and uh, that's exactly the attitude, embracing defeat. Now let me tell you an anecdote of my own father. He was a naval officer. So uh, he was uh, at a naval base near Hiroshima. He saw the bomb. He experienced the bomb, actually. So you can imagine what kind of feeling he had towards the United States. So after Japan surrenders, he comes back to Tokyo, and he has uh, a very, very tense feeling against Americans at that time. But somehow, he decided to join the foreign ministry. And the foreign ministry sends him to Massachusetts to study. So he was stu studying, like you, for his finals, when his roommate, who was a, who was a Marine, um, said, Kazuo, come with me to the hospital. My wife is having a baby tonight. Because as you know, Marines, uh, after they were, they were uh, discharged, they got a chance to go to college. So he was kind of uh, older than my father was. So he was having a, his wife was having a baby. And my father said, well, tomorrow we're having finals. And I said, well, Kazuo, I can't think of anyone else but you. So my father grudgingly followed him and went to the hospital. And uh, together, they were there when the baby was born. And my father wrote later, that was my moment of reconciliation. And he said, a new life is born. Why bother about what we had? We were shooting each other only five years ago, but why bother about that? Now a new life is born. So probably this is uh, kind of a ubiquitous attitude of the Japanese towards Americans. The Ministry of uh, Industry uh, decided that we will have what we call a, a tilted production system. That is to say, we start start by developing natural resources. So we, we dig up a lot of coal and steel, and based on that, we will have the steel industry. And from steel industry, we will have the auto industry. So um, all these fundings came went into specific fields of the uh, uh, of production one by one, and that's how Japan rebuilt itself. And Japan was an a fairly industrial country before the war, so it was not difficult for the Japanese to come back to that. The GHQ had a policy uh, of uh, stripping the landlords from their land rights. So uh, Japanese land before the war were uh, heavily owned by landlords who were not even there. They had a title. And uh, the farmers, most of the farmers were uh, what we call, what we know as, what you call, uh, for the lack of a better word, peasants. So they did not own the land. They were, they were just tilting the land, borrowed by someone else. Uh, and uh, the uh, recognition was that this led to the few, this kept Japan a feudal society. So the farmers, which constituted a majority of the population, should have the right to their own land. So when they were, if they were tilting a certain piece of land for generations, then basically they got that land. The landlords had to give it up because they were not living there. If they were living there, they could hold on to their lands. So that's how 
uh, Japanese agriculture was democratized. The economic relationship is all in all very good. Uh, Japan is a big exporter, but also a very big investor. And the United States is a, is a big investor to Japan. So uh, two economies are pretty much intertwined. And together we export, we build things together and export elsewhere. So that's a win-win situation. Um, but uh, as you correctly pointed out, the Japanese population is decreasing and it's rapidly aging. And that means the, at least Japan has to shift to a different market, that is the uh, market of senior citizens. So the Japanese are coming up with uh, what we call what we call uh, mobile suits. You know, we, you wear things that give you strength, and you can you're able to um, pick things up easily. It looks like it, it, it's not some like Gundam, but not not really. Uh, humans wear it, and uh, we can get become very strong. And uh, so these things, the Japanese company started. Uh, producing uh, to uh, get into the market that's coming towards us. Now, the United States is still a very young country because of the fl influx of uh, immigrants coming in, and uh, that keeps America very, very strong. Uh, of course, the Japanese are eyeing that as well. So we will keep building things that we build now, but at the same time, um, there will be an aging population in the United States as well. So that's a new market for us, not only in Japan, but elsewhere, including the United States. China is also a rapidly aging society, so uh, the Japanese companies are eyeing that market as well. Um, if you take a real long span after my children have passed, I, um, frankly, I don't care. <laughs> okay. I, can't, I can't think that far. But as far as my children are concerned, I think uh, his gener their generation will have a pretty good relation economic relationship with the United States. In Southern California, there are a lot of Japanese Americans, and there is a certain basis for accepting Japanese culture. So not only those of Japanese descent, but from other cultural backgrounds, they uh, grow fond of uh, Japanese culture, tea ceremony, ikebana, flower arrangement, ramen, whatnot. Um, but, and this is a very uh, essential part of Japanese culture, and probably it is fortified when the Japanese are abroad. The ja not the Japanese Americans, but the Japanese expats who live here, they are very into calligraphy, uh, flower arrangement. They, they do that more often, frequently, than what uh, Japanese would do back home. But uh, that, that's a matter of degree. So the question of identity is something very, very important. Um, the Meiji Restoration basically westernized Japan. So are we the West or are we the East? And that's a question the Japanese have been asking ourselves for a long time. I don't think we still have an answer there. And on top of that, um, after we went to war, there was war guilt among the Japanese of uh, having inflicted uh, devastation to our neighbors. Japan is an, uh, engaged in evil deeds, so we must uh, bow our heads. That kind of people. That that's uh, that's a general sentiment in Japan, but there are some other people who think we did nothing wrong in the war. It was right to emancipate all these colonies. These people do exist in Japan as well. So uh, that leads to the question of identity. Are we West? Are we East? Are we guilty? Are we not? Uh, so th the Japanese are still asking ourselves this question. The majority of the Japanese, I would say, are peace lovers. The majority of the Japanese think that we ha we're striking a balance between East and West. And politically, we belong to the West. Okay, but uh, culturally we are di distinctly East, which means that Japan has a very unique identity. Probably that's uh, the major what the majority of Japanese had come to terms with. But again, you know, it has it's a, it, it's a very fuzzy boundary. The the, the ultra right wing is an absolute minority, absolute minority. Uh, the, most of the people detest these people. So they don't enjoy support, but they have a very loud voices. If it's illegal, illegal to protect a fellow soldier, that's too much. So what the administration tried to do is to make that legal, to make it lawful to protect our friends, okay? But not, we're not going to make the leap into uh, 
invading other countries. That's, that's, that's not even under debate in the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. They're not talking about our full-fledged military capability. So when we procure uh, arms from the United States, for example, these planes cannot fly very far. They cannot go to the Korean Peninsula and come back. Why? Because if we purchase planes that can fly that far and come back, that kind of uh, arouses a lot of uh, concern to our neighbors, and we're not going to do that. Why we're not going to do that? Because we feel that's wrong. These islands, the Chi even the Chinese acknowledged them to be Chinese, uh, Japanese territory. And they, we, there's a map that depicts this as Japanese territory. And uh, once oil, there was a potential oil bed discovered underneath, they suddenly changed their position. And said, started claiming it's part, no, it's not part of Okinawa, it's part of Taiwan. So it's, uh, this idea came after a long time. They, the Chinese had every chance to claim these islands, they did not. Why? Because they don't think it's Chinese territory. They started saying that because of oil. The basic uh, uh, picture is that Japan invaded China and uh, tremendous destruction that uh, Japan inflicted upon China. That's the basic. Uh, but uh, what makes things complicated is that China is governed by the Communist Party. The Communist Party has its own way of formulating policies. It's uh, dialectics. In dialectics, when they write policy papers, it's based on dialectics, which means you have the uh, uh, thesis, the antithesis, and sublimation, and get the uh, synthesis. And uh, in order to do that kind of thinking, you have to identify the contradiction. Now, that's where it got, all gets complicated, because they decide what the contradiction is, and they decide they start formulating their policies based on this contradiction that they identified. China, on the other hand, can suddenly change its policy. It looks as though they're very, very flexible. They're not. They get together, meet, and decide to change the basic contradiction. That's how they suddenly change their policy. It's it's very Marxist. It's very Marxist-Leninist. Mm -hmm.